going to be tackling the question, what is art? If you have never considered this before, trying to define art is a particularly tricky task. So I want to start us off by asking you a few questions to help illustrate the challenges that we are about to face. What is the best description that you can think of for the word art? Now, this doesn't have to be right in the dictionary sense, so don't go looking it up on the internet, trying to Google it or find it in Wikipedia. What I want to know is what makes something art to you? Then give me an example of each. A known artwork that fits your definition, so something that fulfills your description, and then a known artwork that doesn't fit that definition. And then after that, why do you think that defining what is or is not art is so important in our culture? Why does it even matter? One of the main sticking points when people try to define what art is, is figuring out what art is not. As the lines that define what can and cannot be art are continually redrawn over the past century, we are going to see more and more challenges for broader definitions of what could be considered quote unquote fine art. And this brings us into a touchy debate. Art versus craft versus design. And I'm going to throw up some definitions onto the screen based on what commonly gets brought up when people try to separate art from craft or design. And all three definitions are going to use those same building blocks, those elements and principles of art and design, but all three have different purposes or intentions. So even though they start from the same place, they end in very different directions. First, we'll start off with a common definition for fine art. Fine art could be defined as the utilization of elements and principles of art in a way that conveys a message, work that is intended to join the conversation that is being held by critics, gallery curators, and artists, or work that might critique that structure. Craft could be considered the utilization of the elements and principles of art to produce a product that demonstrates the technical skills of the maker, work that is intended to pass on traditional expectations that did not originate with the artist. And then we see design, which might be defined as the utilization of the elements and principles of art again in a way that communicates the intentions of the designer or their commissioning party. And this is work that is meant to influence an audience according to already set expectations. So the expectations are not set by the designer, but they are working with conventions that have already been established. And when we see all three of these up, it's quite easy to find examples that work within each of those definitions. You have artists like Picasso who critique the art world and the conventions of depicting space. And his work is indeed shown in fine art galleries and talked about in fine art circles. But why do we then in our galleries show works by outsider artists? People like A.G. Rizzoli, who made work his entire life with no intention of showing it to anyone else but himself and his close friends. Why is it then that work that is being made by somebody who doesn't intend to join the fine art conversation being dragged into the fine art world? Why do we study him now? When discussing craft, it can be easy for galleries and museums to dismiss craft works because their intentions are focused on priorities other than what the art world in the fine art or the academic sense is necessarily concerned with. But if we are to dismiss craft based on intentions alone, then are we also dismissing any culture that is not involved in critiquing the Western art world? Do we throw out everything that comes from ancient Egypt or from Asia or from any non-gallery-oriented culture because it wasn't intended for the galleries? 
and we think about design as work strictly functioning in the commercial world as a mere tool for manipulation rather than a platform for innovation. But what about designers like Betsy Johnson, who utilize the design format as a mode of intense personal expression? Now, I do not have any black and white, clearly defined right or wrong solution for these questions because there is no one right or wrong answer to the question of what should fall in the category of art. All that I'm going to be doing today is presenting you with the commonly accepted information and then you can decide what resonates with you or if none of it does and you want to build your own definition. Now, if you are going to really ask yourself, what is art? You will inevitably have to decide on a set of parameters that allows you to place things into the category of art and not art. We are going to explore four different ways that art can be categorized or defined as modes of intent. And these are art as ritual, art as an imitation of human life, art being what we say art is, and art being the genesis of an idea. When talking about art as ritual, we have seen art already connected to ritualistic behaviors and ceremonies. In many ancient cultures, art helped to facilitate ritualistic and religious experiences, guiding people through their thoughts and philosophies of their day communicating power in this world and in the next. Consider the role of the mandala, which we have seen both being used as a visual means of communicating ideals, but also as a guide for meditative ritual. The same can be said of Catholic rosaries or illuminated manuscripts like a prayer book. Even today, our approach to art is often ritualistic. Think of gallery spaces, which are special places reserved for contemplation and observance. Now, in classical antiquity, this is ancient Greece, art is about the imitation of life. Plato himself speaks about the process of mimesis, or imitations or copies of reality. Greek plays, sculpture, pottery, and painting He kind of scorned them because he considered them to be imitations of something greater. In Plato's allegory of the cave, he told the story of a man who lived his whole life chained in a cave facing a blank wall. The only thing he ever saw of the outside world was the shadows of people as they passed by the cave and left their shadows on the wall. This man came to believe that these shadows were the only real thing in the world, never knowing that there was an infinitely more complex universe just outside his cave. Plato said that mimesis, or visual and performing arts, were like these shadows, pale reflections of something infinitely greater, that greater thing being real life. He also took a step forward from this and said that our entire physical existence, or real life, itself was just another cave, a shadow of an even greater, more idealized world, one that he believed was composed of pure philosophical ideas. Now, just because Plato was a little bit down on mimesis and art because he felt it was just a copy of something that could never really be and therefore was useless, His successor, Aristotle, said, Hey, wait a minute. Maybe there is, in fact, something good that can come from mimesis or mimicry. And he called that thing that you can get catharsis. So catharsis is that purifying or purging of emotions by engaging with art. You yourself have probably engaged with cathartic experiences through artworks. So now let's think, what is a cathartic experience that you have had with an artwork? This doesn't just have to be a painting or a sculpture. This may include a film or a song or a play as well. So what is a work of art that has helped to purify or purge you of emotion? 
Aristotle really believed that there are natural ways that art has the ability to induce catharsis by living through alternate possibilities. He was especially fond of Greek plays, including the tragedies and comedies, for their ability to provide an outlet for emotion. The value of art for expressionism, or the expressing of emotions, is very important, especially in the modern era. We have art therapy today that's built around this idea of communicating in a nonverbal, visual manner. Now, coinciding with the First World War and the rise of modernism, artists were no longer satisfied with the idea of art as it was then being defined. The boundaries of what could or not be considered art were widening faster than ever. Things that would not have been accepted into a museum 50 or even 10 or 20 years before were now being included in galleries. We saw this with Duchamp's Fountain. George Dickey, an art critic, would famously say, Art is any artifact which has conferred upon it the status for candidate for appreciation by someone or persons acting on behalf of a certain social institution. Now, what that means in plain English is, if a curator of a gallery or a museum accepts a work of art, then it is a work of art. The work that started this line of thought is Marcel Duchamp's The Fountain, which he exhibited in that famous show in 1917. The piece itself, a urinal that Duchamp lifted from a local construction site and placed on a pedestal, tested the limits of what art could be defined as. He didn't make it. He didn't really even alter it other than to just sign his name on it. And it wasn't even his own name. It was a pseudonym. And it wasn't even originally made with the intention for conceptual or artistic purposes. Yet, it was accepted into a gallery and is in most of the important art books of this day. And there really is no better argument than Duchamp's Fountain for saying that art really is whatever it is you say it is. And if art is just whatever someone says that art is, then Who gets to decide what is art? Because if you say something is art and I say something is not art, which of one of us is right? And if it's the curator of the gallery or the museum who is the one deciding what is or is not art based on what they will or will not accept into their institution, does that then kind of make a curator an artist? Because they're the ones that's deciding what is art. And if it is the curator who wields all this power, are we ever looking at who curates our art? Who writes about our art? Everyone has a bias and everyone has an agenda. We've already looked at this in our class. And whether you are the art critic for the New Yorker or the curator of the Louvre, or you run a gift shop in a gallery in Myrtle Beach, you are in control of defining art in your institution. And this raises questions about the artists that we see in our museums and our history books, but it also should raise the question about the artists you aren't seeing. Female artists, artists of color. Do those people just truly not make art? Or did they not make a lot of art? Or did they just not make any good art? Or maybe was there in fact a system in place that turns a blind eye to these artists? Again, this isn't a question that I'm going to answer for you, nor is it one that I need you to really come up with a quick answer to, but it is a question you should be thinking about pretty much any time you engage with an artwork. So what Duchamp's piece led to was that prominence of the concept or the ideas of a piece mattering just as much, if not more than, its formal qualities or what it looks like. So what then makes the difference between a work of art and a piece of trash that's just lying around? Arthur Danto, one of the leading philosophers of art in the 20th and 21st centuries, put it this way. Nothing is a work of art without an interpretation that constitutes it as such. Therefore, 
the difference between a shoe that is being displayed in a museum and a shoe that you may see lying out on the street is the interpretation. It is that concept and that meaning that must be tied to the work in order to give it value. So now that we have seen some ways in which you may be able to at least put something into the category of can I even consider it to be art or not, let's now tackle how can one even go about evaluating art or what makes art good. And again, there are many ways that we can explore the evaluation of art. And we'll look at some historical examples as well as some contemporary ones. And you may not necessarily agree with a single one of these. You may find that a mixture of several of them is the way that you prefer to evaluate what makes an artwork good. Now, during the Enlightenment in the 1700s, so this is part of that neoclassical age, this time of Greek revival of looking for rationality, so looking for order and a reason for why we like the things that we do, the seeking to understand and rationalize and categorize things applied to the arts as well. David Hume, a philosopher of his day, wrote many essays on the notion of taste, this refined ability to perceive quality in art. Hume speculated that people of education and experience would naturally reach a consensus of taste, and this consensus of taste would govern what is and is not acceptable in art. So according to Hume, there are things that are considered to be in good taste, acceptable to society, and there are things that are considered to be in poor taste. And the evaluation of what was in poor taste or in good taste was often highly connected to the morals of the time. This painting, now known as Madame X, in a failed attempt to help the reputation of its subject, created a scandal when it was first exhibited. This is a depiction of a notable socialite by the up-and-coming John Singer Sargent. And what you see now is not what the painting looked like when it was originally exhibited. There was one, today quite small, but in its own day, created a massive scandal. And it is the placement of the shoulder strap. And the slipping of the shoulder strap to the side, even though she was wearing a corset that would never have fallen down, offended the sensibilities of the upper class so much that it destroyed the reputation of the woman and simultaneously ended Sargent's career in France. He eventually left to go to America to restart his career. The problem with the notion of taste is that it's extremely arbitrary and it's also extremely narrow. When Hume refers to people of taste, he refers to people of power, people who are white, people who are male. When he refers to education guiding their belief, he refers to the systems that are based on Western European history, systems that are guided by and reinforce tastes of one specific group, white and male and more often than not, wealthy, a whole class system that is run by Fraser and Niles Crane. Bourdieu, a philosopher of the 20th century, put it, taste classifies, and it classifies the classier. Higher classes prefer the kinds of things that maintain their status quo. But maybe, rather than the idea of a set education system providing a school of thought to you, you think that there are some things that are just beautiful, something that everyone can agree is worthwhile. So maybe taste isn't your thing. Maybe beauty is what you think art should be about. Philosopher Immanuel Kant was much more concerned with dissecting the nature of beauty. What makes something beautiful to us? 
And how can we account for differences in personal or cultural tastes and preferences, but still understand that there are things that are almost universally agreed to be beautiful? Something like a seashell or a sunset. And this philosophy that Kant came up with was aesthetic. So aesthetics in the philosophical sense is a philosophical approach to categorizing nature and appreciation of beauty, especially in art, according to an established set of principles. So just like the Greeks, Kant was convinced that there is a system, a reason why things please us, even when they have no purpose towards nourishing or providing any measurable benefit to our lives other than the fact that they exist. Often these things were related to harmony or unity or mathematics. Now it's very important to note that for Kant, beauty was not meant to be mixed with desire. Beauty is purposiveness without an actual purpose. So there is a difference between admiring a painted image and being drawn to it erotically. There's a difference between admiring the beauty of an apple and then actually hungering for it. Once you cross that threshold into consuming something for any benefit other than just the aesthetic pleasure of its presence, then your appreciation of beauty as a cool, detached observance has vanished. But maybe you feel like simply observing for something with no other benefit is not enough for you. Maybe you feel like art should have another purpose, closer to what maybe Aristotle was expressing about art with his catharsis. And it's best for you when art has an emotional connection. Maybe the great works of art express a feeling or an experience so clearly that you feel it too. Tolstoy, the author who wrote the novel Anna Karenina, was a great Russian writer and philosopher in the 19th century, and he contended that the purpose of art and literature was entirely about expressing emotion. So now let's posit this question. What emotions do you feel when you look at this painting, The Scream by Edvard Munch? Do you prefer an artwork that demonstrates aesthetic beauty or that communicates an emotional experience? On the one hand, you can have very personal experiences with art. Art as an object of beauty, art as an emotional outlet. But let's now consider something broader, something more linked to the valuable role that art has played in our understanding of history. How does art work as a tool to understand a culture? How has an artist or the person paying an artist shaped the way that we perceive cultures and history? Think about it. Like, yes, you have the text of your history books, but how do you know what history looked like? You know because you have seen the art. And that art is not something that just randomly generates itself, but it is something that has been created with a purpose in its representation. So in this case, we are going to look at art and its perception of history in the case of Napoleon. So first, we have some paintings that were commissioned by Napoleon himself, painted during his lifetime by people in his court that he paid. Here, Napoleon fills the frame. He is proportionally large in an already very large painting. Napoleon sits astride his horse in full military regalia. This is a symbol of his power, authority, and rise from a military background and his prowess as a military commander. In the background are the Alps, something considered to be almost impenetrable in Europe, yet here they are almost submissive to him as a figure. Now contrast this representation of Napoleon with depictions of him in the 1950s. Here we see in these cartoons a short man who looks indignantly up at the other figures one who is often given to tantrums rather than any actual battle skill. 
Napoleon, the historical figure, is the same person. He hasn't changed, but our perception of him has drastically changed, and that is due entirely to his visual representation. Artworks can be windows to certain time periods, but they can also reveal things to you about yourself or your time period that you currently live in. Oftentimes, the critical conversations that surround a book or a movie or a work of art can be just as much a reflection of the culture of the critics as it is a reflection of the culture of the artists that they are critiquing. The language of art isn't literal, nor is it universal. We talked about how art is so subjective. Art is open to interpretation. And so art is going to communicate. Whether the message that the artist intends is received by people or not. Let's consider for a moment a film. This particular one is Crash, that won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 2004. And when Crash was released, it was celebrated for having a forward thinking attitude towards race relations. However, in the decade plus since Crash has been released, it has been reevaluated, and critics now view it in a different light according to the changing attitudes of the day. And what that does is yes, it does reveal something of Crash in its reassessment, but what it more shows us is how our culture has changed in what we consider to be acceptable or not. So, if that is the case, what then matters more? the intentions of the artists, or the people who later interpret it. We already have discussed how context changes the perception of an artwork, so today let's end on this. Is there value in art without having context? Philosopher Foucault, in his 1960s publication, The Author is Dead, insisted that what the artist or the author intends when they create something matters very little in the face of those who will view it later. So how much then do the intentions or the context of the artist matter? Many works are anonymous, and if we did not know who the artist was or what they intended, does it diminish our appreciation of their work not to know? What if we don't even know about their culture? Is there still something in any artwork that we can respond to or find value in? And at the same time, do our personal experiences and responses negate the intentions of the artist? In the end, which do you think matters more? <music> 